Thank you, Rin. Take your Bibles once again and open them up to Psalm 32. Appreciate that music. We have been blessed. Many of our young people who enjoy singing and playing instruments, and it's time marches on. As I look back and see Don with tears in his eyes, his daughter was singing. Remember when Josh and Rin were up on the stage graduating from kindergarten, and this year they'll be graduating from high school. Lord willing, all right? We'll kicked out before that. But I really hope that Rin and Josh can play a guitar duet. Wouldn't that be neat? I think it would be cool. No pressure. And so I think sometimes the parents are under more stress than uh, the kids when there's a graduation. But you know what? Ceremony involves something that we're celebrating. And, um, and so I'm looking forward to that. Continue to pray. As, as I don't want to start talking about too many things that deal with 2020, but as we're looking forward to God's uh, hand of direction, uh, pray that Chris and Brian Baggett will, um, not that they will, be, they, they've confirmed that they're going to be with us the end of, of May. And so we've got some exciting things that I'd like to see happen, including a ladies' conference that we'd like to host at the end of May. And um, some of the good old days when the ladies had a lunch in the gym, the men took care of them. Do you remember that, ladies? We're thinking about doing that with Chris being our keynote speaker. So uh, I, I get excited. Sometimes I can't contain some of the things that I want to talk about. So as we look forward to 2020, but Chris and Brian Baggett will be with us for some special meetings and then possibly a ladies' conference. And guys, we're going to do something fun maybe that Friday night uh, before that leading up to that possible conference. Um, and again, we're just looking forward to Clint and Rita Vernoy being back with us before they head back to Paraguay in June. And hopefully and prayerfully, Clint will be our keynote speaker for the high school graduation as well. Psalm 32 is an awesome psalm because we serve an awesome God. David had the great blessing of being able to be used as the human instrument to pen these wonderful songs of praise. Sometimes we might hear a song that we just heard a moment ago that was a blessing that was written by a friend of yours. That's great, Rin. And whoever wrote that, that was just tremendous because God is beyond but yet he, he chooses through his spirit to give us some information about who he is. And here we see the blessings that we have. I toyed with the idea of calling this sermon, don't be like the mule. I didn't think that that would stick. But I decided to go with this, blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure. The word blessed is such an awesome word. It's a, it's a really interesting word when you think about it. The, the beginning of the book of Psalms, sometimes it's called the psaltery. It's, the, it's a hymn book. The first word is blessed. The very last psalm begins with that word. When we think about what Jesus said, his first sermon, he began with what we call the Beatitudes, and he said, blessed. What does that word mean? Why is it so important? We are blessed beyond measure. Sometimes instead of saying, I am blessed, like I asked you to say a little bit ago as we started our service, we say, I don't think I'm as blessed, I'm just stressed. And you know what? We have stress in our life, and sometimes stress can be a good thing that moves us to action. But we're blessed. But do you realize just how blessed you really are? Can you ever put a price on your salvation? Could you ever repay God for his eternal gift of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you realize that because you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you are blessed beyond measure? And I think sometimes we might lose sight of that. I know sometimes I have. The word mashil, as I said before, means contemplation. Perhaps even a better word would be understanding. From the perspective of I get it, I'm thinking about it, and I want that truth to affect the way that I live. Psalm 32 is a wonderful psalm of praise written by King David expressing the awesome truth of being blessed beyond measure. It's also a psalm rejoicing in the spiritual possession of, that believers, possessions believers have in Christ Jesus. Think about the way that Paul began his letter to the church at Ephesus. He introduces himself as the servant and apostle, but then in verse 3 of Ephesians 1, he writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In the preface of this psalm, we read that it says a psalm of David. Perhaps some of your Bibles may say something like a confession and forgiveness, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But as I said before, the word mashil carries with the idea of contemplation, 
an understanding that leads us to action. For King David desired greatly for the believer who, to, who was going to read this and sing this song to understand the things that God had taught him. Isn't that awesome sometimes when we come to that place where the, the light literally goes off in our heads and we want others to know what we've learned? We were playing this game that we got, one of the board games that we received for Christmas called Headbands. And you wear these old plastic headbands, you need to put a card, and you ask questions and they're trying to figure out what card is on there. And Andrea's was a light bulb. And when she finally figured it out, the light went on, literally, she was, she was a light bulb. You know, when we think about this, sometimes spiritually speaking, we come to these places where we get it. And it may be that, well, I've been saved for 50 years or whatever, how long you've been saved. And it's just like I read through the Bible and I know what it says. But still sometimes you read something and you're just like, wow, that is just such an awesome truth. Even though I know it, the light's on. And God revisits us in that way. His spirit is upon us in a great and mighty way. But there we're, we're communing with God through his word and we're singing praises. And that's why the very end of that psalm is written the way that it is. This is a, a psalm that involves the forgiveness and confession of sins. But more so, it's what God does for us because he's the one that forgives. And he's the one that hears our prayers of confession and forgives and restores us. I want you to know, church, this morning that this particular psalm contains three very important spiritual blessings that David claimed as his, that we as children of the Most High God can claim as ours. So let's examine what made David write and sing a psalm like this one. But before we do that, let me ask you this simple, these three questions. What makes your spirit sing? What makes your spirit sing? And sometimes we might be listening to the radio or have a CD or our phone, phone, however, whatever way we're listening to our music. We just sing a song because we like it. We like how it sounds. Maybe we're not giving a whole lot of thought to the words. And so our emotional part of us, our being is singing it. But when our spirit sings, there's something, something different. And what do you rejoice? And thirdly, to whom is your joyful praise expressed. So we see here very right away, the first spiritual way the believer in Christ is blessed beyond measure is through the fact that God forgives us. I call it the divine pardon. Verse one reads, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse two reads, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. The word blessed is a position of favor and literally means to be happy. It means that. That there is something that affects our spirit, that affects our, our soul, that affects our bodies. That we walk around not having everything under control and everything's going our way because we know it's not always going to be like that. But our relationship with God is right and good. And we know that our sins have been forgiven and they've been forgiven forever. Our relationship with the Lord, one commentator noted, with the Lord Jesus Christ is something no one, no one could ever put a price tag on. We're blessed beyond measure. Remember those commercials from MasterCard and Visa where a father took his two boys to a baseball game and he, the cost of the baseball was five bucks, the cost of the baseball glove was $15, the cost of the tickets was $20, the, 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 the price of spending the afternoon with your sons and creating some lifetime memories, priceless. Do you remember that? Remember those commercials? And they, they kind of uh, triggered that emotional side of us that thinks about the way in which we look at some things you just can't put a price tag on. And that's what we're talking about here. He's saying the person whose transgression is forgiven, the person whose sin is covered, the man or woman, the child of God unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity is blessed beyond measure. Man's sin can only be covered by God's righteousness. We see that in Titus. Could, hold your place in Psalm 32, but please, if you would join me in Titus chapter 3. The little book, that, the little letter that Paul writes to his other son in the faith, so to speak, where we, where we think about this concerning our salvation. Starting in verse 5, as Paul is giving Titus some um, important things to remember, he says that when we think about the, the very fact that Christ has appeared to man and that our salvation is not by works of righteousness, verse 5 of Titus 3, which we have done, 
See, our, our sin being forgiven is not a certain amount of sacrifices or a certain amount of obedience or a certain amount of, of uh, things that we do to merit this. And notice what he says. But according to his, that is God's mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through who, church? Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified, being put in that right position, made right with God, by His grace we should be made heirs according to the hope, that confident expectation of the promises of God, of eternal life. And then Paul says, this is a faithful saying. This is worth noting. Let's go back to Psalm 32. What we think about it, it is through the righteousness of God, and particularly the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. The word forgiven is well, in the New Testament is the Greek aorist tense, an action that took place in the past and continues to have an effect in the future. So we look at the way in which the, the, the psalmist is writing this. Yes, we look at it as a New Testament believer today, as forgiven forever, but we know that we can go to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and we can confess our sins to God when we have sinned and God will forgive us. The death of Jesus Christ on the cruel cross of Calvary covered man's sin by paying the penalty of death for all man's sin. And we rejoice in that. So it's not about, as other religions falsely teach, that you have to earn your way to whatever heaven or eternal life you are granted once you, quote unquote, make it. There is a confidence that we know that our sins have been forgiven. But it's not because of anything that we have done other than calling out for the Lord to save us. When Paul was writing about the importance of being an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he ends that particular part of the letter by saying, For he, God hath made him, that is Christ, to be sin for us. Christ is our sin bearer who knew no sin. He never experienced sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In order to have that relationship with God and have eternal life and be in the very presence of God, we must be declared righteous. And God has done that because he sees us through the blood of Christ. Dr. David Guzik in his commentary on, in, uh, on this passage uh, in, in a, a commentary called Enduring Words said this, King David spoke of real forgiveness by the declaration of God, not merely the quieting of a noisy conscience or an imagined peace with God. This was a standing with God declared and given, not earned. Verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Now Paul uses this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 4, talking about the very fact that the righteousness that we need is not the righteousness of man, but the righteousness of God. But we can also apply this to when we sin, even as believers. David was talking about a point in time in his life, some argue when this was, perhaps this could have been uh, similar to the Psalm 51, a uh, psalm that he wrote after his sin with Bathsheba and the killing of Uriah and other things that were involved in that. But he's saying, when I chose to keep quiet, when I did not confess my sin, look how it affected his entire being. We don't view this and say, well, this is kind of like how he's trying to get us to understand it. No, I think he literally was doing this. And I think when we understand that we can think that we can hide sin, you are never hiding it from God. He says, when I kept silence, when I did not deal with my sin, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Because his physical body was roaring. It was aching. This is what he means. Verse 4, he says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. I'm glad that we as believers cannot live, hopefully we cannot live in continual sin. And I am, I'm only going to speak for myself here, but I know that when I choose not to obey God completely, that God's hand of conviction is heavy on me until I get that right. I don't ever want it to be soft. Because sometimes we need that heavy hand to guide us and direct us and remind us. He says, the hand of God was upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. And then Selah means stop and think about that. All musical instruments pause and give thought to that truth. The divine pardon that's given to us by God is through Christ and is certainly worth rejoicing. As we look at verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. This is the solution. This is what he said he eventually did. I acknowledged my sin unto thee. 
If you're taking notes this morning, please note a New Testament word that's used quite often is the word confess. And the word confess means to say the same thing. Literally, that's what that means. It comes from two Greek words, homo, which means same, and legeo is a form of the word which means to say or to speak or to uh, pronounce. Homo legeo, to say the same thing is confess. So when we have confessions of faith, these are statements of truth that reveal to the fact that this is what we believe. We agree to these things. We use the word statement of faith now. Um, we have a young man who um, I thought was here. Is John here this morning? Who's going to come to join? He's downstairs? Okay. And John's going to come forward this morning and join our church by statement of faith. A confession means that it's what you say. So when we confess our sin, we're stating that we agree with our sin the way that God deals with it. God has said it. Uh, so verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Let's continue reading. And mine iniquity have I not what? Hid. Now sometimes our sin is something that we do need to make revealed as we talk to others and especially as we ask others to forgive us to whom we've wronged. But we are never hiding it from God. But it is good for the soul for us to deal and confess with our sin and not to hide it and not to act as though it's not there. He said, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, the proper name of Almighty God, Jehovah, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And then he says, pause and think about that. Not only did he feel the heaviness and the burden, we might even use the word conviction of his sinful way. He didn't say, well, I felt that way, but I didn't really do anything about it. He says, and then I asked God to forgive me. Then I got it right. We cannot expect God's blessings. We cannot expect God's direction if we're not first willing to deal with the sin in our own life. And that's what David did. I want you to note in verses 6 and 7, not only divine pardon, but divine protection. He was talking about God guiding him and directing him. Somebody once said, I think when we get to heaven, we'll realize all the ways in which God protected and watched over us that we had no idea about. Verse 6 reads, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. We think about some of these tsunamis in the recent decades and things, that, of course, because of security cameras and even just people's phones and cameras, we've been able to see devastating things that most people can only remember experiencing if they were there. You see these waves that crash onto beaches and just destroy all the houses uh, and for, for, for acres and acres as they, as they come in. And we think about the roaring waters that, that cause even great ships to fall over. He uses that. He says the floods of great waters. But he's talking about that spiritually and emotionally, the way that sin can cause us to become overwhelmed with life. He says they shall not come nigh unto him, knowing that Almighty God has me securely in his hands, gives me peace. How about you? To bring about a blessedness. It's interesting that the word blessed in the very first word of this is actually in the plural tense. Some would say, oh, blessednesses. Really, that's what it's, it's, it's the idea of something that is just continual. It's more than just one thing. And we see the blessings of knowing that God watches over us. He protects us. God has promised to me a place of protection and safety, but it's not just any old place. It's with him. Notice he says it's in his presence. Verse 7 says, For thou art my hiding place, not a hiding place. I go to the Lord, the rock, the one who will protect me. That's where I run. And this is what David was saying. He says, this place is the place that I go. You are my hiding place. Sometimes when I don't even know where to go. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. And then Selah again. Think about that. A lot of pausing in this psalm. Because there's a lot to think about. And I think about this, it's interesting, as we look at the word hiding place, sometimes that word hiding in the Hebrew is also translated in our Bibles as secret. In fact, it's, it's not just any place, as I said before, it's in the presence of God who is always with us. 
And that's why it says in Psalm 27, verses 5 and 6, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. This is God who protects us, God who watches over us. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock, and now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Even in the midst of the storm, God is protecting us so that we can sing praises unto him. And this is what he's saying. God is able to do that. In Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, listen to what it says here. He that dwelleth in the secret place, that's the same word as hiding, hiding place, secret place, same word, of the Most High, talking about Jehovah God, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Awesome verses. The Lord, he watches over us, he keeps us safe as a shepherd does his sheep. And that's why it's awesome as we think about it. Let's go to Psalm 23. I know many of us know how this goes, and perhaps you've memorized this. I remember learning this as a young child. The Lord is whose shepherd? He watches over us. He puts us in his, he is my hiding place. He is my shepherd. I shall not want, I shall not lack anything because God will meet that need. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For who's with me? Even if you were in a place where you're all by yourself. You know, we don't like to be alone. That's not the nature of most people. We want to be around other people. But we know that even if we're by ourselves, unable to communicate with others, God is always with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, that my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For how long? Forever. God protects his children. As we go back to Psalm 32, as we think about what we just read in verses 6 and 7, these are not promises that are conditional. They are promises based upon the very fact that he has declared that he will do that. Especially and even when we choose not to always obey him the way that we should. That's why I said sometimes I think God will reveal to us the way in which he watched over us and protected us even when we weren't always following after him like we ought to. Ira Sankey, I'm not sure if you know who he is, he for many years led the music for D.L. Moody's evangelistic meetings, and he was traveling by steamboat down the Mississippi River on Christmas Eve, in fact, in 1875. Some of the people recognized him for who he was and his singing, and they asked him to sing a song, and so he agreed, and he began singing a song that we sang this morning, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. And when the song was done, one of the listeners stepped forward and asked, did you serve in the Union Army? And Mr. Sankey answered, yes, I did. He says, can you remember if you were doing picket duty on a bright moonlit night in the summer of 1862? And he said, I think I was. This man continued by saying, I was serving in the Confederate Army when I saw you standing at your post. I raised my gun and I took aim and I was standing in the shadow, completely concealed from everyone, including you, while the full light of the moon was falling upon you. At that instant, you raised your eyes to heaven and began to sing that same song that you just sang. Let him sing his song to the end, I said to myself. I can shoot him afterwards. I heard the words perfectly from his lips. We are thine, do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. And this man said, I began to think of my childhood and my God-fearing mother who sang that song to me. When you finished, Mr. Sankey, it was impossible for me to take aim again. I thought, the Lord who was able to save that man from certain death must surely be great and mighty. This is the God that we worship. And these stories, I'm sure, are countless. And we're going to enjoy eternal time with God, perhaps remembering the ways in which that happened. Thou art my hiding place. From his emotions, yes. From his burdens, yes. From the spiritual disconnect, yes. From all these other troubles, it says, Thou shalt come pass me about with songs of deliverance. God gives us a song even in the night. But not only do we see divine pardon and protection, but we, just, we see divine guidance. 
And this is the third blessing that David claimed as his. Divine guidance. Verses 8 all the way to the end deal with that. It is our Heavenly Father who gently and lovingly guides us along our journeys of faith. Aren't you glad for that? We're not going alone, but we need to be sensitive to that leading. We need to be submissive to that leading. We need to say, Lord, lead, and I will follow, not the other way around. Sometimes we do things, and we, got, we want God's stamp of approval on it, when God said, I had no part of this. Charles Spurgeon said, as servants take their cue from the master's eye, and a nod or a wink is all they require, so should we obey the slightest hints of our master. Why did he say that? Because in verse 8 he says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Andrew and I communicate sometimes in Morse code through our eyes. Usually it's her to me sometimes. And sometimes I'm not always processing it the right way. There might be things that she's kind of, you know, telling me through her eyes, and I'm saying, okay, I think I got it. And then she's like, no, no. But we all do that. And that's what this verse is saying. It is a closeness. There is a way in which God communicates with us, and we are so in tune with what God wants us to do that he does not have to beat us over our heads with a two-by-four. With his eye, he directs us. He says it. Read it again. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. This is David speaking on behalf of what God has said. Now some would say perhaps David is talking about what he had learned and he will teach others. But I think he's speaking on behalf of God here when he says that thou sh I will guide thee with mine eye. The way in which God leads and guides us is so important because our decisions matter. We're going to give an, we're going to give an account for everything that we did. There's no trap door standing before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat that whether we pass or fail, that somehow the trap door leads to hell. That's not how it works. The Bible says there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, and there never will be. But we will give an account for everything that we have done. And oftentimes I think we may even fool ourselves into thinking that some things are okay, they're not that bad, they're all right, and we do things because we just want to. We're not as sensitive to the Lord as we ought to be. We're not following the cues and the hints and the way in which he's directing us. And yet we wonder why we seem to be tail spinning. Or we seem to be not going in the right way. The believer understands that. So in verse 9, notice what he says. He says, be not as the horse. Now some of you know horses intimately and you love horses and that's great. My couple of experiences with the horses were not that great. But I'm not against horses or anything like that. I went horseback riding with Andrew when we were in high school on our senior class trip, and I had one horse that was just stubborn and um, wouldn't want to go the way that it... So finally this lady said, you got to let, let it know who's in charge. Pull the reins. But look, he says, be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. They need to be guided. They need to be prodded. They need to be instructed whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. They have to be uh, coerced, so to speak. And this is what God, through King David, is saying, don't be that way. But sometimes I praise God for even when we are stubborn like a mule, that God still reaches out to us. And sometimes he does major things in our lives to get our attention. And sometimes those things hurt. Just like the chastening hand of God hurts. And it may be because we're sinning or maybe because we're not really following after God like we ought to. Perhaps there's some type of idol or thing that has replaced uh, the, the importance of God in our lives. Verse 10 says, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Who are the wicked? The ones that don't care about God's direction and guidance. The ones that don't care about the fact that they've been forgiven of their sins. He says, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come past him about. That's where I want to live in that place where I'm sensitive to God's leading. The believer in Christ will overflow with joy when he, when he walks the path laid out by his Lord. And this is what a verse 11 is about, but let me read to you another verse, Psalm 16, 11. It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. Then it goes on to read, In thy presence is fullness of, anybody know the next word? Joy. Amen. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We do what we do because we want what we want. I know that's profound, but it really is. We do what we do because we want what we want. What pleases you is the things that you're pursuing after. The things that you spend your money on and your time and your devotion. The things that you do are because you want what you want. 
And so here we see in verse 11, as we come to the end of this sermon this morning, and thinking about divine guidance, we recognize that it's a work of God, the Holy Spirit, to teach us by making his word real to us. Lord, instruct me. Lord, may I be sensitive to your leading, even in the things that don't always seem like we're going the right way. Lord, I know there's a purpose in it. This knowledge is not passive. Church, it's not passive, but it's entering into the glory of his word. We need to understand that the sufficiency of Scripture is more than just some neat little phrase. It should be the reality of your life. If we're not in the Word, we're not asking God to direct us, then we're not going to find this guidance that He has for us. Weeping and despondency and even discouragement do not belong to the believer who lives apart from this presence of God and Him guiding us. When we focus on what is broken, all the problems we will be unable to enjoy, rejoice and be glad. And this is his point here. Now, as we walk in God's ways and be filled with his spirit, which will enable us to do righteous deeds. Verse 11, let's read it together. Be glad in the Lord. Delight in God. I mean, many of you were perhaps around family that you don't get to see very often. And I'm not going to speak for you or assume that this was the case, but hopefully that was a glad time. Don't tell me if it wasn't. Because I'm related to you, some of you. But you're around some people that maybe, you know, it's like, you know, annually is about as much as you want to be around them. But others, perhaps it's something that we were just with Chrissy and Rob, and, and it just seemed like they were here, and then they were gone. It was just so fast. You just want to hold on to people that you love, and you want to freeze time. But he's saying we're glad, we're delighting in the Lord. Not just in God, but delighting in life because of God. That we're not walking around as mopey people. God is so good. Well, tell your face that. We need to live in the reality of gladness. He says in rejoice. That word is used a lot in the Bible. Continually joying is really what that means. Ye righteous and shout for joy. You know, sometimes we don't like to shout unless we're in an environment where it's okay to do that. Church is one of those places. It's okay. Some of you, <laughs> oh, thank you, Tim. Right on cue. Hey, and we look at this and sometimes we, it's almost like, well, that's awkward. We have no problem cheering for the Patriots and shouting, which some of you guys are going to be doing in a little bit. Shout for joy. Let your voice be heard, not to bring attention to yourself, but the great God that you serve. This is when we will rejoice over God's love is when we remember that he has forgiven us forever. He has pardoned us. He protects us. And he has a path for us. So he says, shout for joy. Let everybody know, and don't be ashamed, all ye that are upright or righteous in heart. Are you truly blessed beyond measure? Are you blessed? Do you live in that reality? Is that your identity? Sometimes we say, oh me, oh my, I'm stressed out. Well, you could be, but you're blessed if you know Christ is your Savior. Are you here this morning certain of that? Maybe you're uncertain of that. Maybe you're not sure if you really are blessed the way that God says. Sometimes we, even as Christians, sometimes we might redefine the word blessed and think, well, it's a whole bunch of stuff that I have. You know, there's a lot of miserable millionaires. You'd like to say, oh, man, I really wish I was one of those people. You know what? Sometimes I think if we, we think the, the, the answer to all of our problems is more money. And it's really not. I think if God blesses us, maybe in your finances because of your business and God is blessing that, and you're able to help other people, wonderful. And there are many good Christian millionaires, perhaps even billionaires that are out there. But that's not really the answer. The answer is to delight in what God has already given you. And let that permeate your being, your testimony, so that you shout for joy because God is worthy to be proclaimed because he has blessed you. Do you see God's hand of protection upon you? Do you see God guiding and directing you? These are evidences and signs of the very fact that we know God. As we bow our heads and close our eyes for a time of invitation, we're going to sing a song simply entitled, Jesus Paid It All. We think about the great blessings that he has bestowed upon us. What else can we do than rejoice?